Okay, well, it's 12 o'clock noon, so let's get started. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Melinda Berdanier, and I am the Grants Coordinator for the South Dakota Humanities Council. I'd like to welcome all of you on behalf of SDHC to the annual Festival of Books. And we're so pleased that you've joined us for this year for our virtual 2020 event. If you've been with us before, you know about our housekeeping details, but I'm gonna share them again for any folks who are joining us for the first time today. I'd like, to, if you'd like to ask questions or share comments with today's presenters, just type them in the chat section on Zoom, which you can open by sliding your little mouse down and clicking on that conversation bubble at the bottom of your screen. Or you can type them in the comments section on Facebook and we'll pass along as many as possible at the end of the session. Also, it would probably help if when you post your question, you give the name of the poet that your question is for if it's directed sort of towards a certain person. You can buy books by our presenting authors at Zambro's Variety Special Online Festival Bookstore, and that's zambros.com, or for children's authors at Child's Play Toys website, childsplaytoyssf.com. You'll find buttons on our book festival website that will take you directly to our booksellers. And I'll also include links in the chat once we get going. To help us continue to improve the festival, we'd appreciate your filling out an evaluation form. We'll email you a link to the form at the conclusion of the festival, and you can find a link in the chat section on Zoom. If you click the link in the Zoom chat, once I've posted it there, it will open a survey on WooFu, which is a website where you can put your evaluation, continue and, and uh, complete your evaluation. So if you do that once I've posted it in the chat, you can leave that survey open. And then at the end of the event, you can go back and complete it while it's fresh in your mind. Finally, you can help keep the festival free by making a tax deductible donation to the South Dakota Humanities Council. Just visit our website, sdhumanities.org and click the donate button. This festival would not be possible without the generous support of the numerous organizations and individuals who have already donated and are acknowledged on the back of our festival guide, like this here. And on the back, we have all of our donors. And you can even download this from our festival webpage on our website. So now, let me tell you about our program. This program is called South Dakota in Poems, The Celebration Continues. And our presenter is Christine Stewart Nunez. As some of you may know, Christine had a similar event last Thursday, and this is a continuation of that one. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Christine Stewart Nunez is the author of Postcard on Parchment, which was in 2008, Keeping Them Alive, 2010, Untrust, 2016, and Blue Words Greening, 2016, winner of the 2018 Whirling Prize. She is a professor in the English department at South Dakota State University, and she is the South Dakota Poet Laureate. Stuart Nunez's latest project is South Dakota in Poems and Anthology, a collection of poems about the people, landscapes, and cultural life of the state. First, we'll hear from Christine, followed by several of her contributors. Then we can see if you have any posted questions in the chat, and we'll go from there. So now, Christine, I'll turn the program over to you. Thank you, Melinda. It's really great to see everyone here today and the continue the, the celebration of the book. So first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who helped make this possible, including the South Dakota Humanities Council and SDSU for their contributions of resources, <laughs> time, time and resources, and then to all of our book patrons who donated money to the project as well as the South Dakota State Poetry Society who um, chooses the Poet Laureate and who believed in this project and when I pitched it in my application to be Poet Laureate of the state for four years. So I really appreciate um, everyone's time, uh, money, advice as I, um, as I um, created this book and then now that it's here, a lot of you have received your copies in the mail already, <laughs> which is exciting. Um, and I still have some to send out. So uh, yeah, so it's here. It's a real, it's a reality. Uh, one of the things that I'm excited about is that uh, 
is that if if I wish we were face to face, to be honest with you, but one of the things that this is allowing us to do is have more contributors involved in the launch, which is why there's actually three three parts of the launch, two October dates and then a November date, and um, because everybody wanted to be part of it, and I wanted to make sure that everyone who wanted to be part of it could be a part of it. So that's one of the great things. I don't think that. Laura would come from Vermont, for example, for the, for maybe she would have come from, maybe next year we can have a one year anniversary and everyone can come to Brookings for that. But, um, you know, I don't know um, how many of us could have gathered for, for the face to face. So the, one of the great things is, is this virtual scenario that we can all see each other and hear each other's poems. So thank you for that and for the Humanities Council for making it possible. So I would be happy at the end of the, of the reading to answer questions more specifically about how I chose the poems or my vision for this or any of those sorts of questions. Um, but right now I'd like just to get us hearing everyone's um, readings of the, the poems that they contributed. So I have a list, not sure everyone who's on the list is here. I think I've seen most everybody. But what I'll do is I'll just mention, I'll say, I'll introduce you by your name and you can go ahead and give a brief, you know, one sentence or two biographical information about you. <laughs> um, maybe where you're now, where you are right now and how you're connected to South Dakota and then read your poem or poems that you contributed to the anthology. And then we'll just, you know, try to keep that going for a little bit and keep readers going. And then at the end, everyone can ask their questions or post their comments and we can talk further. Okay, does that sound good? Okay, so our first, oh, and one thing too is the last time we did this, we had a little bit of trouble here and there with the mute. So just be patient and we'll, we'll get you on, um, we'll get that happening if, it's, if you're muted. Or, or I think we're gonna be able to unmute yourself. So we'll see how it goes, but um, just let's be patient and we'll, we'll make it happen. Okay, so our first reader is Travis Jacobs. Hello everybody, my name is Travis Jacobs. I'm the co-founder of an organization called TNT Healing. We help people write better stories and live their best stories. I've lived in South Dakota 40 of my 42 years. I grew up uh, south of Sioux Falls and then now I'm back south of Sioux Falls living again. I'm honored to be part of this with everybody. Look forward to hearing everybody's words. This poem I have for you is called A Farm Story and it goes like this. He wore a green and yellow colored dust covered DeKalb hat. His pants were permanently pressed from tractor seats. He really didn't have time for fashion. He didn't even have time to name his own pets. Every dog he ever had, he just called him Old Shep. Except for that last dog, that one got an original name and it actually happened to outlive him. That dog was like 25% shepherd, 15% healer, 12% collie, 45% cockleburs, 8% wolf, and 100% farm dog. That old man's orange Wheaties box rose up and out of the orange cupboard every morning before the sun even thought about cleaning the sleep out of the corner of her eyes. He was up before every early bird and every worm and out the front door because they don't make snooze buttons for chores. And I'm not gonna say they don't make them like that anymore because I still have friends and family who work that way. He did have his own style. He would say things like, holy Johnson's and son of a biscuit. He was a mixture of brute strength, brute cologne, hay baling hands, silage in his lungs, and 188,000 acre heart filled with rows and rows of love and commitment for his family. He never punched in or out because fields unfold from souls and not salaries. They say that a farmer's life is lived with a handful of dice, a mindful of old almanac wisdom and Kenny Rogers advice. There's no shame in playing a game every year where mother nature deals the hand. My God, by golly, farmers, they leave us, but they never leave the land. That old rug of a dog of his, Buster, he still wanders the bean rows, being led by his nose, dreaming of being pet one more time by his friend's old calloused hands. He was a farmer. He was my grandpa, a hard working man. Thank you. Thank you. Our next reader is Laura Jean, um, and you can pronounce your last name properly. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. I'm Laura Jean. 
Jalou. Um, I got to say a quick hi to my mom and my nephew Linus who are on today watching. And um, I am a, a South Dakota native from Brookings. I uh, do live in Vermont now, but we carry South Dakota. We have a Karen Kinder original behind me, uh, who was my middle school art teacher, the landscape of South Dakota. Uh, my poem today, White Woman South Dakota, tells about how um, that South Dakota is part of my identity and never really leaves me. Um, so White Woman South Dakota, which starts with an epigraph. At the center of the universe dwells the great spirit. And that center is really everywhere. It is within each of us, black elk. I grew up in Indian Hills next to an unmarked pioneer graveyard where the Northview Lads and Lassies 4-H club planted flowers under a metal cross painted white. It was flag day, 1992. My mom served strawberry shortcake with berries from Sanderson Gardens. Everyone in Brookings knows about Sanderson strawberries. Josie's dad owns the farm and he paid us $6 per flat to pick the fields in early morning, staining our fingertips red before volleyball camp, before swimming at the Hillcrest pool. Six is $30 when you're 10, but I was probably older. In the field of my memory, we're all hunched over, searching for the big, ripe, juicy ones, the ones we hold up to show off or keep greedily to ourselves, eating until our bellies ache. I pat my baby's belly as he falls asleep in his crib in Vermont. My hand looks old in the low light, so close to the beginning of someone else's journey. I left home over 19 years ago. People ask where I'm from, then tell me I'm the only one they know who's lived in South Dakota. I don't feel special. The state never felt like it was mine to claim, yet I was given a childhood of summers, camping in the Black Hills. My great grandparents from England planted themselves in pier. Lonely and exposed, I always knew I wanted to leave, go east, see the ocean, but I belong to the weathered rock in Sylvan Lake. A trail at the water's edge leads hikers to the highest point east of the Rockies, Black Elk Peak. No mountain matches it and it doesn't matter. I carry the view inside me. Thank you. Our next reader is Kira Wolf. Thanks, Christine. Um, I am an artist um, in multiple disciplines including uh, book design and a writer. And I'm also a social science researcher I'm currently going to USD. And I have, I'm born and raised in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. So this poem is called Dakota comma South. There's a saying around these parts, Mount Rushmore ain't nothing but a hill and you ain't nothing but a coyote skeleton or a glassy-eyed deer on the side of the road, or the howls of harsh winds over eroding stone, or the memory of innocent indigenous lives lost, or a lonely tractor interrupting the vastness of cornfields, or an urban legend that screeches in the badlands, or the fear which ghosts my heart when I climb up a waterfall, too small to be beautiful, but big enough to kill. Thank you. <laughs> Our next reader is Jean Emmons. Thank you, Christine, for this. It's a beautiful book, um, wonderful voices. I've lived in uh, South Dakota for 13 years now and a transplant from Iowa. I taught at a Briarcliff University for many years. Uh, my poem is about Mount Rushmore also and about which I have much ambivalence. And uh, it's about what might or might not be seen by those huge stone eyes of those presidents. It's called A View from the Mountain. Even with his great sad eyes, with pupils drilled 22 inches wide to give the impression of depth, Lincoln hardly can have seen how the mountain once heaved its back, the rock rising up, igneous and intrusive a billion and more years before Borglum. Roosevelt with his stone spectacles hardly can have told what creature might in a billion years 
roam and puzzle over the ruins of all this when earth has another thought. And we squint from our thin slit of the timeline. We gawk in awe at how the mountain is brown branded, the honeycombing drills, the masculine mastery, chisels, air hammers, sheer audacity, blind ambition, the blasts, the slabs of granite tumbling. All the while, deep in some quarry, a ferny fossil lies stamped on limestone, the imprint of another humbler species, utterly devoid of hellfire, heaven, and hubris. Time will go on rippling through the crust. All eruptions and interruptions folded back into the earth. A rusting steel drill bit broken off and abandoned spreads its stain. They seal the widening cracks with silicone. See how the bighorn sheep climb on the scree of shattered rock where torsos would have been. Hawks tilt and glide, nut hatches flit from branch to branch, and in the pines, the wind shushes and keeps the mountain's secrets. Jefferson, with a mouth 18 feet wide, keeps silent also, stricken dumb and blind, and Washington, his gaze on the horizon could hardly have seen even the saddles suspended on thin cables before his very eyes or the sweat and dust of those who dangled there, who blasted and drilled until their bones shook loose and went home to their wives and night terrors who dreamed of infinite time, the depths of space, and rose up with a cry from their mattresses to cling to their bedposts for dear life. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, our next reader is Linda Starbuck. I retired to the, uh, South Dakota three years ago, and I live in the Black Hills outside of Rapid City. And my poem is called The Relentless Sound of Water. Life on the creek is a bottomless pour, like mommy's flowing breast, like mommy's curing kiss. Its nursing rhythm nourishes the ebb and flow of seasons. Doe and fawn step gingerly through crystal current, licking glittery seeds of sun. Gander and goslings glide over falls, diving with delight through strokes of light. Birch and aspen sway goodbye to golden offspring as each leaf tumbles in a tilt-a-whirl of foam. I submerge another day in your cleansing womb, pregnant with memories and buoyant beneath the water striders who nibble on my debris. Our next reader is Carolyn Prentice. Hi, uh, I'm retired from uh, 33 years of college teaching and I did my last 15 or 11 at, rather at USD and I moved here from Missouri with my husband. And when I was in the middle of retiring, everybody said, well, where are you going to move? Everybody. And he said, what? We love South Dakota. <laughs> you know, we're staying here. So we live on a, a small, uh, sustainable farm outside of the morning. So here's my poem, Almost April. It could be almost anything, late wet blizzard, Daffodil fingers, bird song, tornadoes, 
shiny, clean, white and black calves, a purple crocus bravely reaching out, floods and damaging winds, trucks mired in soggy, rutted lanes, load limits posted on swelling roads, humid, hot, gray days, a late frost, gorgeous lingering sunsets with rosy afterglow, the first black and green ribbon snake basking in the sun, flies and ladybugs awakened, opened windows, the precious glass drops in the propane tank, muddy footprints across the kitchen tile, spring cleaning, new clothes, new hope, dashed again by one late wet blizzard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next reader is Tom Simmons. Or Thomas. Oh, trying to get you muted, I think. Unmuted. So I think that Thomas is connecting to the audio now. So I'll just give him a minute. <laughs> Carrie, your poem made me think about the snow that is just falling <laughs> here in terms of like, you get those snow, those that surprise snow in April and you get the surprise snow in October. <laughs> Thomas, can we hear you yet? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Excellent. Thank you for your patience. My name is Tom Simmons. I'm a lifelong South Dakotan. I live in Vermilion, and you wouldn't know it, but I spend most of my day on Zoom. The title of this poem is Unwrought. Having harnessed the power of the atom at Trinity, they set about unharnessing it that it might take wing. Not long after, not far from Hermosa, we buried quite a surprise. After months of stiff backs, blisters, Long hours, we completed the task, stretched and admired it. With the toes of our work boots, we dusted its clamshell covers with West River soil and a few cockleburs for good measure, and then waited for just the right moment. Not even Oppenheimer could truly conceive its overpowering might, blasting human beings, melting them in a flash. Perhaps there, while it stood ready, still and erect just beneath the ground, its crown barely fitting within its rooftop, ready with the turn of a key or two, to do its dance, to arc skyward into space, heedlessly heavenward, then summit into the blackness surrounded by stars, tilt tip separate its momentum spent and dive back down. Almost lazily at first, then accelerating, gathering, awaiting just the right moment when it opened its mouth to the saints to deliver its message, to become a flash, a burst of radiance, a terrible splendor. But thrown to a shining and thereby unstitching us, as it unstitched itself. Perhaps there we exhibited the natural and ultimate extension of free will and the opposable thumb. Oppenheimer, a serious student of poets himself, might have quoted John Donne as if quoting the bomb addressing the physicists, thou hath made me and th shall thy work decay. Or from another of Donne's holy sonnets from which Trinity itself received its name, as we sweaty workers leaning on our earth movers, admiring the launch site profiled by the light afternoon sun boasting to us, gluttonous death will instantly unjoint my soul and I shall sleep a sace. Dr. Oppenheimer might muse of Titan's terrible power to decay our work so awful it was almost poetic. This crescent misplacing its disc, this deathness forgetting itself, a sunset stripped of a dusk, a self-madeness which possesses its own becoming to thereby unmake us, which stands where we buried it and thereafter attended to it, or we lived with it, we made peace with that thing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, their next reader is Kevin Cole, and I'm not seeing Kevin on the, on Kevin, are you here? And I'm not seeing you on your name. Um, I'm not seeing Kevin. So Kevin, if, 
I've made a mistake and you are somewhere. <laughs> You're somewhere here and I'm not seeing you. We'll squeeze you in at the end. We probably won't even need to squeeze. It'll just, we'll just put you at the end. So just let me know in the chat if I've missed you somewhere. So then our next reader would be Sharon Schmielarts. 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 <laughs> And I know you're here somewhere, Sharon. There you are. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. Perfect. Is that okay. Yeah. No. We can hear you. I'm still kind of shaking from that last line, and we made peace with it. Yikes. Um, I'm uh, Sharon Schmelars. I was born and raised in Mobridge in the north central part of South Dakota. My maiden name would seal be less would be more familiar familiar grins or grins. Um, I'm going to read a poem in three parts about the Missouri. Uh, before the Oahe Reservoir was uh, took over that part of the Missouri near Mulbridge or yeah and it uh, this poem also includes the origin of the Missouri. First the river Glow of warm velvet, the west. At 12, I wrote my name and age in its closet. I knew its hills like friends, how they change blue, yellow, green, sentinels keeping time. I knew dust in hair, shadows in a living room, tragedies boxed and covered up, a warped sense of possession. I knew how in evening it cooled off, some rest on the forehead, some grace in quietness, some darkness coming over its shoulder. I've seen the river's plain table and its gifts from the dead daughter, shells, birds, the white tail which makes its way through blonde grasses to drink at the shore. Two. These mountains too large to be called home. You run from them for shelter in a town. You dominate your life, your house with kitsch. As for the river, it's more modest. It stays and it leaves. Who can compare it to generations? Made from a forked design, the Madison, Jefferson, Gallatin. Its bed brown as a trout or bullhead its water green and blue, jump two feet, and you've made it from bank to shore. Three. Pebbles and dirt underfoot, juniper musk, carried on a chill May wind, here and there coves along the river, the charred remains of an evening fire, impossible not to want to light one, if the creature you are is human. If it's night and there's driftwood at hand and you're with friends or alone and you're listening to the river pocked with age, still flowing indelibly by. Thank you. Thank you. And our next readers are the are Brad and Jennifer Sewell. I think I saw um, them here. I already saw the name. I saw Jennifer's name on the participants. Jennifer and Brad, are you prepared to read? I just saw muted, but actually we couldn't do the recording. So I think Brad probably sent a late email saying that we weren't going to read. Okay, that's fine. That's because fine. I just wanted recording. So, and I don't want to do it just cold on Zoom. I could have if I planned on it, but we didn't. Okay. Recording. So I'll that's go back fine. I just wanted. I just didn't want to miss you. No worries. Well, thank so you for the book. It's lovely. <laughs> You're welcome. So our next reader then would be Holly Mosley. Hello, I uh, grew up in Michigan around lots of trees and lakes and moved to the Chicago area as a child 
And um, I tell people I keep moving west till I find my home. And I have found it on the northwest plains and prairies here in sight of Montana, Camp Crook, if anybody knows where that is. Lots of people ask me if it's actually in South Dakota. So my poem is um, from all the driving I have to do out here. It's called Straight On to Forever. It seems the roads lead straight on to forever, and they do. We could get lost out here in our thoughts, going deep into reflection or expanding beyond the moment, considering plans for the future or simply adding to the list of things to get in town. We could get lost in the history that deepens the further we go, the Battle of Crow Buttes, homesteads gained and lost, stone circles, forest fires, old roads, old men and women. Or we could get lost quite literally. The roads are not as straight as they seem. They shift subtly, sometimes suddenly, and with them the landmarks change. What we thought we saw or knew is no more, or so it seems. We must pay attention, be present, watch, listen, keep sight of our own roads, explore with caution, curiosity, preparedness, and above all, respect. Such are the landscapes of our lives. Thank you. And then our next reader is Ruth Harper. All right, can you hear me? I don't know if you can see me, but you can, I think you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay, seeing me is not a big treat anyway. <laughs> um, I wanna thank everybody who had anything to do with the book. It is solid, it is strong, it is a wonderful collection. Um, and thanks especially to Christine. And I'm, I'm so grateful to have one page in this book. And my poem is called Febru February Snow. It may not be true that the Inuits have 400 words for snow, but in South Dakota, snow itself possesses an intricate vocabulary uttered in ancient choruses just beyond what the human ear can detect. Blizzards chant in eerily triumphant tones of Tibetan throat singing monks. Their incantations echo across empty prairies, summoning spirits of endless winter. Mostly though, snow is quiet, hushed, almost silent. Only the alert ears of wakeful owls and restless newborn infants may discern its midnight murmurs, exhaled in fresh and startling spills of silver shining in moonlight. At sunrise, snow speaks in simple, civil, declarative sentences about February, inevitability, perseverance, survival, cleanliness, cold. Thank you. Thanks. Did I miss anybody who who wants to read a poem they had in the collection? Did anybody? Did I? Did Kevin? Did I miss Kevin? Did he ever come? Well, there is one um, poet whose poem I would like to read. Uh, Mel Thomas. Um, Mel passed away just a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I was really touched that his family included the fact that he was accepted and he was going to have a poem in this anthology in his obituary. Because Mel was a doctor for years. He had a really amazing career, a lots to be proud of uh, in terms of his family and his contributions to our state. And so I would just like to read his poem for you. And it's called Prairie People by Mel Thomas. We are our wind-blown people, we on these upper northern plains. The wind blows where it will, through leafless trees, across the snow. Seemingly angry, its friends, the leaves, no longer there to play with. So it blows ever more fiercely, contenting itself to blow snow and ice crystals into snow waves and sun dogs. 
The tree waves and bends in the wind, seemingly dead and lifeless before the blasts. The tree knows in its ancient wisdom, it will blossom and leaf again. It prepares and grows deep in its roots, deep in the earth, content with its own rhythm. Impetuous and foolish wind, it says, if you knew the rhythm of life. We are a wind-blown people. From our very early childhood days, we come to know the earthly rhythms. We huddle in our coats and scarves, our lives directed inward just a little and grow and create inside and burst forth then in song, in joy, in this cold middle ancient Yule season before the leaves come again to play with the wind. Mm -hmm. good. So that, yeah, that was a lovely poem to read. It, uh, yes. I wish he could have been here to read it himself. So um, that leaves us open up for some questions or comments from you all. So yes, I'll kind of jump in here. Um, we have one comment that says, I'm from Texas listening in and enjoying the experience immensely. It reminds me of my university days in Amherst, Massachusetts. <laughs> um, and then we do have a question for Travis. So we have a person who says to Travis, thanks for the farmer grandfather poem. Please repeat the name of the poem. I want to share with my brother-in-law, another great man. So if Travis could jump in and provide that poem name. Thank you. Uh, it's called A Farm Story. A Farm Story is the name of the poem. Thank you, Travis. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me that you can find the book to buy the book <laughs> at um, sdpoetry.org. So that's the South Dakota State Poetry Society website. And you can also find it at the Brookings Book Company here in Brookings, but um, we're trying slowly to maybe get it into some bookstores across the state. But as we are a organization of volunteers and I am still, I'm teaching three classes and uh, tending to my family as well. So it, it might be a little slow trying to get it into some actual bookstores, but you can buy it online at our website. And any money that we make from the book will go into more promotion of poetry across our state, so. Great. So while we're waiting on some more questions to come in, um, which I hope they do, I know people have things that are rolling around in their minds a little bit, so pop your questions in there. Um, Christine, I just wanted to ask you again, I know you did this on, on last, Thursday, but I'd like you just to talk a little bit again about um, your role as the Poet Laureate, your um, decision of choosing this anthology project, and what it all means and how, yeah, so. So, um, so the anthology, the idea of the anthology isn't, isn't a new one, um, but what happened was I, um, in South Dakota, it used to be by law that the Poet Laureate was appointed for life. And the last Poet Laureate appointed for life was um, David Allen Evans, and he's still alive, but he decided that he would, uh, he wanted to step down and kind of pass the baton to somebody else. And so the South Dakota State Poetry Society lobbied um, to have the law changed so that it would be something that a new person would be chosen every four years. And so the first person under that um, law was Lee Ann Roapa, who teaches at USD. And so she was Poet Laureate for 2015 to 2019. And then the way they, um, the SDSPS picks the Poet Laureate is they just send out a call for applications. And in the application, you need to list your credentials as well as what project that you would do to promote poetry, reading and writing across our state. And so um, I threw my hat in the ring. Um, anthologies is just something that kind of, you know, a lot of poets do or, or like to put together. 
Um, but I, I studied with Ted Kuser at the University of Nebraska Lincoln when he did when he was the United States Poet Laureate and he uh, came up with American Life and Poetry, which is a syndicated newspaper column. And I was one of the first graduate students to help him with that project. And he really instilled in me this importance of poetry in terms of culture and as a reflection of our lives and as Americans. And he really loved these like short, sweet poems that were with a certain charm he said, um, not necessarily sweet, but with a certain charm. And so I had that in the back of my mind. And then I also went to hear the second to last poet laureate um, of the United States, Tracy K. Smith, who spoke in Spearfish, South Dakota. And she put together an anthology of 50 poems. And she led a really robust, dynamic, energetic discussion of those of two of those poems in that book. And so I thought, well, OK, I'm going to combine those two ideas and um, kind of have so like a poet poetry about South Dakota. And so I went after I was chosen um, poet laureate. I started right away to kind of get the get the idea out and start calling for poems. I wanted to do it at the beginning of the four years because I want to use the book as a tool to to, to go around and discuss um, poetry, kind of like Tracy K. Smith did. And so I was, <laughs> and so I put the call out and I tried to get that out to as many people as possible. But then I was also terrified that I would get no no submissions. And so I had some graduates, uh, some undergraduate students who were helping me look through past petals, um, issues of the South Dakota State Poetry Society's journal, Past Petals, and find um, poets that we knew about that were affiliated with South Dakota. And um, I put the call out so it could be poets in living here or affiliated with South Dakota who like had lived here or grew or went to school here. So it could be um, a larger kind of group because like Laura Jean said, it's, you know, people, even if they leave, they have strong, often to have strong connections to the state. So <clears throat> I got a lot more, <laughs> I got hundreds of submissions. And so it was really a big job to decide what, what would make it into the, to the book. So um, that's how the Poet Laureate kind of gets chosen. That's what I did for my um, application. And, and then that's kind of where I started there. And then, you know, um, I think then the next question is like, can, what did I, how did I choose <laughs> the, these poems for the anthology? And it was, it was really hard because I had so many quality of poems. But one of the things I started to see was that there were some poems about similar, a lot of the similar themes. So there's a lot of snow poems or there's a lot of driving poems. And I didn't want a whole book about, um, the prairie <laughs> because there's mountains here too. So I, what I tried to do is I tried to take um, poems that were uh, you know about South Dakota reflective of our uh, of the many the cultural influences, the people, the languages, the histories, but also um, a little bit of the, a, a few poems about some of those common themes or those common images that I was starting to see in the poems. So I tried to kind of have a balanced, balanced book that way, a kind of holistic book about, about what the writing happening here and now. There are also some um, uh, things I wanted to make sure that I included. I wanted to include poems that were praising our state and celebrating our state, but also poems that were you know, somewhat critical or calling our state into question. I think the literature has that important role into, into doing both of those things and everything in between being complicated and a generative that way. So I wanted the book to kind of do that as a whole. And I wanted to include different kinds of poems in that regard. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that this, this, that there are poems, people are, people with many books have poems in this anthology and people who never published a poem before have, have a poem in this anthology. And I wanted it to be kind of like a representative of, of different kinds of voices and different people's experiences with po poetry and poetry po publishing. So I, I was hope, I'm hoping that you know, anybody can pick up this anthology and find 
something that they, an image that they know or something that they can relate to or that speaks to them is my ultimate goal with this anthology. Great. So um, <laughs> there's some, some questions in the chat. Um, um, Dana wrote that there's, there's some, yeah, um, you know, one of the things that, that, um, I think Holly and I were talking about the end of that poem, is that what we're talking about? <laughs> and then, um, and then I think, you know, for me, a poem is never finished until it lands in that final collection of mine, like, and it maybe even changes afterwards. So I'm not surprised if people keep revising. I um, typically, the poems are always, always generative, are always ongoing. So I'm not surprised if people took a few uh, changes. I don't know if, if Travis, you want to address that question or Holly? Yeah, I would agree with what you said. Um, it, it, they're always changing. And then sometimes I like to practice stuff and do it from memory. And while I'm practicing, I'm like, you know what sound cool is if I change this just a little bit. So that mm -hmm. poem, uh, I wrote it when my grandpa passed away like four years ago, and it's changed. And it'll probably keep changing until <laughs> I stop doing it. So yeah, it just kind of just go with the flow. And if I feel something different, I just change it up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Um, plus, uh, I know you sent the poem to me and I now I do remember making some changes to it, but I don't I didn't think to go look back at the email stream. So I just took the copy I had on my computer and used that. But um, actually, originally, you and I were talking about a different poem. And then I had to tell you that was the Badlands in New Mexico, not yeah. <laughs> not our Badlands, because um, it, it is that poem is very evocative of the feeling of a place. And um, you know, I literally jumped at my own shadow, but but um, I don't remember this one ever being published before. So it was, an, I had to go looking for where I had it. So thank you for including it because it definitely is how this place here feels. So thank you. Um, I'm not sure there's a question of, from Brenda about the topics and the structure. Um, I kind of, I, one of the things that I like to do is is to make an argument about uh, about something through the structure, the organization of a book of poetry. And so one of the things that I was challenged by in this is that I could have organized alphabetically. I could have organized it by region. Um, there are lots of ways that I could have arranged this book, but I decided that I was going to put it into conversations. And so I didn't make those conversations obvious in like the table of contents, for example, but um, one of the things you'll notice is that there's like a little group of poems together about birds. <laughs> there's a little group of poems together about interstates and traveling, or there's a little group of poems together about history, because they're in these little conversations and they believe, of course, they, they're, it's not rigid, like that's not necessarily what they're even about, right? They're, they have larger themes and, and, and richer themes to them too, but I just wanted to kind of see how different writers were talking about similar things. And so I just put them in, in little kinds of conversations. So it might be fun to try to figure out what some of those conversations are. <laughs> but I didn't want to call too much attention to them because, I mean, you know, I might think a poem's about like a cottonwood tree and the writer might say, oh, that's not about really about a cottonwood tree. <laughs> that cottonwood tree is just a symbol of something else. So. Yeah, I just that's that was a fun way for me to organize the book and then to make the argument about poetry and being important to our conversations and being part of our culture. So. Um, Someone has asked if there's a way to touch base with you, Christine, after the call. Do you do you um, do you want to answer? Yeah. Or do you want yeah. to post so, um, your yeah, sure. You can also always find me um, on my university <laughs> email, christine.stewart at sdstate.edu. And um, I have my personal email too, but I, I think it's easier just to find me at my at the university <laughs> website. So 
So it's Christine. I'm going to type it Christine, here. Yeah, Christine, yeah, Christine.stewart at sdstate.edu. Put it in there, man. Um, yeah. Um, Laura Jean, did I did I talk about did I answer that question for you or did you can you say more? Well, yeah, I, I know that um, you, Christine, probably a lot of the submissions came in like pre uh, pandemic and some of the other national issues that have taken the stage with Black Lives Matter. And I just wondered how um, you know how how the anthology as a as a one of the 50 states, how, how the anthology speaks to like South Dakota, but like, did you see any, and I haven't, I haven't received my copy, so I haven't read all of the uh, poems yet, but did you see any, any conversations like you were suggesting, like how they kind of opened wider to our identity as the United States of America, like how it spoke on a federal level, maybe? Um, yeah, I, I, the, la the deadline for this was March 1st. So it was right before, <laughs> right before the pandemic kind of rolled out across this, the country and the state in particular. And, and right be and before a lot of things changed, I feel like in a lot of ways, this is like a little um, time capsule. Like it's already an artifact of a different point of time, right? Because things have shifted so much. But I mean, I don't, I'm not sure how it really, would speak in terms of, I mean, one of the things I, I'm pretty certain about is that everyone who lives here or who has lived here somehow is shaped by the geography and the weather. And I know that sounds like sometimes we make fun of that. We're always like, oh, everyone talks about the weather. But I mean, everything we do with our lives is shaped by, by, the rural nature where we live or even in the cities how far it takes to get somewhere or get get resources or make decisions about things um it, decisions about where how we travel and where we go and so i think there's this there's this sense of being really influenced by that even if it's very very obliquely and i think that i mean i i don't know if everyone in every state could, would say that exact, like that exact same thing. I mean, maybe people in Florida <laughs> are shaped by the weather, or, but, but, you know, I mean, I know growing up in Iowa, I didn't have that sense, really that sense of being part of the prairie, you know, or part of the Midwest. Like I lived in Des Moines and I lived in the suburb and things are very, you know, what, I didn't have that sense that here people seem to have, no matter where they live in Sioux Falls, um, Rapid City, even the bigger cities, there's still this sense of being part of this, this larger fabric of the state that has a certain um, constriction that way. I was, and thank you so much. That's, that's an illuminating answer for me in studying a lot of the Detroit poets who write like for their lives, but based on race and how they are treated. And, you know, it's like, but the way you're describing like the fragility of living on the plains with the weather, the, you know, geography, like what makes us fragile, which I think might be, I don't know, just a common thread on, on like how poetry it comes about and is created. But thank you, that's a great answer. You're welcome. So we're kind of coming close to the end of our time together, but I'm, I still want to give you time to ask your questions. So we're not, you know, we're not going to shut it down as long as people have questions, I think. Um, Christine, do you think we've seen them all? I'm just going back up here. Uh, let's see. I think so. I guess you kind of touched upon the fact that a lot of people from South Dakota do write poetry. There was that sort of that observation. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, I can, I, Ruth, can I pick on you for a minute? <laughs> you know, Ruth and I are colleagues at SDSU. You know, I've known her since I've been here for 13 years and I didn't know she wrote poetry. And I don't know how I found out that you wrote poetry. What did you, I mean, the, I think you just like said something and I was like, oh, well, I'm, or, I'm like doing this anthology. You should send poems or I don't know. Did that's how I've discovered that you are a poet. Anyway, she like has these really beautiful poems. And I was like, there you go. You know, like so many times that happens where 
I just, someone's like, oh yeah, I kind of write or like they write on the side or they dabble, you know? And I'm like, bring that dabbling out, you know? Let's talk about the dabbling. Let's, let's, let's connect as other writers because that really, you know, I, I've only grown as a writer through my relationships with other writers and with other, and, and sometimes that's through reading, but there's so much more enrichment that happens through conversation and, and just supporting each other and hearing each other. So I, I really, I am excited that every time I go to a place in South Dakota or every time I open up an opportunity for to see work or to listen to work somebody else I, somebody else comes forward like the chat i don't think chad robinson signed up for any of the launches but he writes a lot of haiku in pier south dakota right and i you know these great haiku <laughs> that's happening there you know it's just it's really it's, and then chastity jilson i don't think she signed up either but she's ranches way out west south dakota and she wrote this, she wrote this hilarious poem about um, trying to make dinner and the only thing that's there is the animal products and the, the, the animal like feed or me medicine like stuff for stuff for the animals but not food <laughs> for people right is in the refrigerator and it's hilarious and I, I was just so pleased to get something get a poem like that and you know where would wh where would I see that nor you know every day and I won't mm -hmm. so I see my students work but I, I don't get a chance to to see broader broader work. So this is just a great um, way to connect to writers and connect people, I think. Um, yeah, if um, we have another, there'll be, we'll put something on the uh, South Dakota, um, the sdpoetry.org website about the third November launch or the first, the third <laughs> section of this, the third iteration. So be on the lookout for that. But otherwise, I really appreciate everyone's contributions and being here. And maybe next year, if we can be face to face, we can have a year celebration, <laughs> a year, a year long anniversary party for the, for the anthology. So. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you, Christine, and for all of the wonderful poets and for everybody else joining us. So like Christine said, keep in mind that there's another presentation coming up. It's November 12th, right? Right. Mm -hmm. In the evening. All right. So unless you have anything else to add, Christine, I think maybe we'll just leave each other now. Yeah. And it's been great sharing this time with everybody. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>